الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد وبه قال حدثنا عبد الله بن يوسف قال أخبرنا مالك عن حميد الطويل عن أنس رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أتى خيبر ليلا وكان إذا أتى قوما بليل لم يغر بهم حتى يصبح فلما أصبح خرجت اليهود بمساحيهم ومكاتلهم فلما رأوه قالوا محمد والله محمد والخميس فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خربت خيبر إنا إذا نزلنا بساحة قوم فساء صباح المنذرين صدق رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد كلما ذكره الذاكرون وصل على سيدنا مولانا محمد كلما غفر عن ذكره الغافلون اللهم صل وسلم على عبدك ورسولك اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد أفضل صلواتك Tonight, إن شاء الله will share with you the story of the battle of Badr غزوة Badr As all of you here who've been attending the Friday evening sessions, you know that we started learning about the Ghazawat, the military expeditions from the Sirah, from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So we have so far learned about all the major expeditions that have occurred during the first six years after the migration of Rasulullah to Medina. The first year there was nothing major. The second year there was the Battle of Badr. The third year there was the Battle of Uhud. The fifth, the fifth year there was the battle of trenches and also the battle of Banu al-Mustaraq. And the sixth year there was the incident of Hudaybiyah. And now this is the seventh year. In the seventh year, there is this major event known as the Ghazwa of Khaybar or the Battle of Khaybar or the military expedition of Khaybar. <clears throat> Before I touch on that, inshallah, I just want to quickly point out in the chain of narrators in this hadith of Imam Bukhari, rahmatullahi alayhi, there is one person whose name is Humayd al tawil Literally, it means Humayd the tall one. And it's true. The reason why this scholar was called Humayd al tawil because he was really tall. Exceptionally tall. So in those days, it was common to identify someone because of something distinct, some distinct identity mark they may have. There was one companion of the Prophet ﷺ who was known as Dhul Yadain, the one with two hands. Everybody has two hands. <laughs> or at least most people, unless someone's hands are amputated or something like that. Everybody has two hands. But the reason why this particular companion of Rasulullah was known as the one with two hands because his hands were exceptionally long. 
he had exceptionally long hands. So the easy way for Sahaba to identify him is to call him Dhul Gadeen. So they used to call him Dhul Gadeen. And then there, there was also this very popular custom, this popular tradition of naming someone after their occupation. If someone used to, used to sell clothing, they would be associated with that. It would become part of their last name. If someone was associated another kind of trade, that trade would actually become part of their last name. So they would be referred to, to that and it would essentially become a part of their name. So these are some common and interesting things from the Arab culture or from the early Islamic culture. And there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you don't identify someone with something that they don't like to be, to be identified with, then it's okay. If there is something that they don't like to be identified with, then it's not fine. Then it's not okay. Like for example, if, if being tall is considered a bad thing, then you don't call, you don't make that part of their name. Or if someone does not like to be uh, known with their, their, with their trade, with their occupation, uh, then you don't identify them like that. So in the seventh year, there was this major battle between Muslims and Jews. Until now, there had been no major incident between Muslims and Jews. So far, the only confrontations that had occurred were between Muslims and Mushrikeen, the non-Muslims of Arabia, pagans, mushrikeen, and non-believers of Arabia. So, all the battles that have occurred so far, the Battle of Badr, the Battle of Uhud, the Battle of Trenches, the Battle of Banu Mustalaq, and finally, the incident of Hudaybiyah, all of these had occurred between Muslims and the mushrikeen. Nothing had happened so far between Muslims and Jews. When Rasulullah arrived in Medina, he made an agreement between Muslims and the Jews of Medina. These were the only two major uh, parties in Medina, Muslims and Jews. So Rasulullah entered in an agreement with the Jews of Medina and that agreement was basically to stand for each other, to support each other and to defend each other from outsiders and live as, as good citizens of, a, uh, of the same country or the same state or the same city. Medina was, as a matter of fact, was a state at that time. So Jews did betray Rasulullah at times and therefore some of their tribes were subjected to exile and one of their tribes who were subjected to exile was Banu Nadir and another tribe that was subjected to exile was Banu Qaynuqa both of these tribes when they left Medina they came to Khaybar and settled there. Khaybar is about 93 miles from the blessed city of Medina. And for a very long time, it had been a home for Jews of Arabia who had left Palestine, who had left Jerusalem, who had left Syria, Damascus, and other places because there were persecutions of Jews in those places by the Romans, by the Christians, 
And therefore, Jews fled from those places and they came and settled here in Khaybar. Likewise, around the same time, there were Jews who were exiled from those places, from Jerusalem, from, uh, from Syria and, the, and Bilal al-Sham, and they came and settled in Medina. And many of those Jews who came to settle in Medina, they chose Medina to be their place of migration to be the place for their settlement because they had been foretold in their scripture, in their books that the last messenger of Allah will come to this land, will come to the land of Yathrib or the land of Medina and will spend the last years of his life here. So they chose Medina to be their place of migration and to be the land of their settlement because they wanted to be with that last prophet. And they wanted to support that last prophet. They had already been foretold in their scripture and in, by their prophets that the final prophet who will come to Medina, he will have many fights and many battles with his own people, with the people of Arabia, with Mushrikeen. And Jews decided at that time that we will support this prophet. We will be under his flag and we will fight alongside his army. But later, when Rasulullah did come to Medina and when Jews did find out that the final messenger has come, but he is not from Banu Israel. Instead, he is from Banu Ismail. He is not from the children of Yaqub Ishaq Rather, he is from the progeny of Ismail And that made them outraged and upset. And that caused them to rebel against the Prophet And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made mention of that in Surah Al-Baqarah. Before Rasulullah's emergence and his arrival and his appearance, they used to they used to bet against the mushrikeen of Makkah by saying that you can persecute us and torture us for, for all you want, but when the final prophet will come, we will take all revenge from you. We will be in his army, and we will take over your land, and we will, we will overpower him. But when that final messenger came, they turned away, because they did not accept Rasulullah to be the final messenger from Banu Ismail. They thought there was some rivalry between the two branches of the progeny of Ibrahim were both the children of Ibrahim Banu Ismail and Banu Israel. They're both the children of Ibrahim He is the father of all. But as it does happen, sometimes in families, one brother doesn't like the other brother. And even if one brother likes the other brother, but later on, the families don't really like that. So one family does not like the other family, even though they are close relatives, not distant relatives. And among distant relatives, it happens all the time that one doesn't like the other. So they developed this, this hatred for the progeny of Ismail salam, and they wanted the last messenger. Their wish was that the last messenger would also be from Banu Israel. But that didn't happen. Instead, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Banu Ismail for the birth of the final messenger the last messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Anyways, so Jews had nearly all of them settled in Khaybar. In the sixth year, as I shared with you, Rasulullah entered in an agreement with the Mushrikeen of Mecca or in general with the, with the pagans of Arabia. And that agreement was initially seen as the surrender by Muslims to the forces of Kuffar and also a weakness on part of Muslims. So in general, people perceive that Muslims have now become weakened because they have given up everything. Every condition in that treaty was seen as a victory for the pagans and as a loss for Muslims. And that news traveled to the Jews living in Khaybar as well. And they interpreted that the same way. They considered that as a surrender by Muslims and as a weakness of Muslims. So they thought that the state of Medina has now weakened. Therefore, they started plotting to take back the state of Medina from Muslims by killing them, capturing them, and destroying them. In order to test the water, they sent few, few small groups of archers and invaders to attack the suburbs of Medina. So there were a few incidents in towards the end of the sixth year, sixth Islamic year, and also towards the beginning of the seventh Islamic year. They sent few people from here and there, they would bribe them and they would give them huge, uh, uh, huge incentives to go and attack the <coughs> suburbs of Medina, the surroundings of Medina. And in the suburbs of Medina, there were pastures that belonged to the Sahaba, and there was one pastor that particularly belonged to Rasulullah In that pasture, there were about 20 she camels. These she camels were, were not able to obviously live in Medina because Medina was a small city. But outside of Medina, there were pastures and these pastures were owned by different Sahaba, different people in Medina and one pastor was owned by Rasulullah It belonged to Rasulullah And there were 20 camels in that pasture. So once Jews, they encouraged a nearby tribe which was their ally, Banu Ghatfan. They asked them to go and attack that pastor that belongs to Rasulullah and they did. So about 20 people from Banu Ghatfan, they came and they attacked this pastor belonging to the Prophet The one who was grazing the, the chi camels was the son of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari So they killed the son of Abu Dhar al-Ghifari and his wife was there as well. They captured his wife. So they took his wife with them and they took all the 20 sheep camels belonging to Rasulullah and they ran away. Someone saw all of this happening and he started screaming. He went to Medina and he started screaming that we have been in, we have been attacked, we have been attacked. And Salama bin Akwa was the one who heard that Muslims have been attacked, Medina has been attacked. So he quickly got on his uh, horse and he started chasing them. He, he narrowed down the direction and he followed them. And he was a very, very skilled archer. So he started shooting arrows at them from behind. 
And he would say, Ana ibn al I'm the son of Aqwa. And today is the day of destruction for the stingy and for the miserly people. The reason why he called them stingy because they, it was, it is, it is a form of disgrace for an Arab to be stingy. Arabs are known for their generosity. So, Salam al Aqwa did not swear at them, did not curse them. Instead, he chose to just label them as stingy people, which was an, an insult and a disgrace for them. Anyways, he caught up to them and they realized that they have been, they have been uh, pursued and caught by Salam al Aqwa and they could not face him. They could not withstand his, his, uh, his skill and his power. So they started fleeing away. Salaman bin Akbar did not stop. So they started leaving camels behind. One, two, three, four. Eventually they left behind all the camels. And then they, they kept on running away. They still had a lot of other things with them like heavy shawls and other ornaments. So they started dropping those things behind because it was heavy and it was slowing them down. So they started throwing those things behind and they started running away. Finally, Salva bin Aqwa he caught up to them at one point and they surrendered. He overpowered them and now they are in complete control of Salva bin Aqwa Rasulullah was also informed, so he came chasing them as well, and he caught up to uh, Salama bin Akbar and he arrived at this point. So at that time, Salama bin Akbar said to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, I have chased them down, I have caught to them, and I have overpowered them. I have complete control over them. So now you should kill them. Now remember, this pasture belonged to the Prophet ﷺ and all these camels belonged to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ was so calm and he said to Salam bin Akbar that when you have overpowered someone or other people, then be kind to them and forgive them. Ya ibn al-Akbar malakta fa'astir. When you have overpowered your enemies, you don't need to show force to them. You don't need to be merciless towards them. You can show mercy and forgive them or at least be soft and be kind towards them. And therefore the Prophet ﷺ let them go. But the Prophet ﷺ realized that this is a bigger problem. And if we continue to allow this kind of behavior of the people of Khaybar to exist and to prevail, it will only get worse. So the Prophet ﷺ, after consultation decided that we should mobilize and we should march on Khaybar. And this was a final decision. So in Muharram, of the 7th Hijri, the Prophet Sallallahu mobilized all the Sahaba and 1600 of the companions joined the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 1400 of them were on foot. They had no camel, no horse, no donkey, nothing, no mule. 200 had horses. And this is 93 miles from the blessed city of Medina. So they started marching towards Khaybar. Halfway between Khaybar and Medina, there is the city or the village of Banu Ghatfan. Banu Ghatfan were, was a tribe of about 3,000 people. So Rasulullah decided to stop at Banu Ghatfan, tried to you know, make an agreement with them. 
not to come for reinforcement of the people of Khaybar. Because the people of Khaybar heavily depended on Banu Ghatfan for their security, for their backup, and for their reinforcement. And Rasulullah in his wisdom, he taught that we should first settle this issue over here, so these people don't come to stop us over there. And don't interrupt us when we are in Khaybar. So Rasulullah entered into agreement with Banu Ghatfan, and the agreement was that they should not come to help their allies in Khaybar. Otherwise, there will be consequences for them as well. So Banu Ghatfan, they realized that they have no option to, uh, to be with their allies, to support their allies, and therefore they submitted to the conditions of Rasulullah When Rasulullah was all set from this side, and he was satisfied. Then they moved on and they arrived at Khaybar. They arrived at Khaybar at night time. And whenever Rasulullah would arrive at a place at night time, he would never attack any city at night time. Because attacking at night time is a cowardly act. When other people are sleeping and they have no chance to defend themselves, you attack them. That's not what the Prophet ﷺ would ever do. So whenever he would arrive at a city at night time, he would not invade, he would not attack them. He would wait till morning. And in the morning, if he heard the Adhan of Fajr, it would give a signal to him that there are Muslims in this town, therefore the Prophet ﷺ would not proceed. But if there was no Adhan, and it was, it was learned that the enemy is ready to fight, then the Prophet ﷺ would give orders to attack that city. So in the morning, early morning, the Jews of Khaybar, they pulled out their tools for farming, for cultivation, and they came out. Khaybar was a land that had citadels, that has fortresses. In total, they had eight citadels. They were divided into three areas. Each citadel belonged to one huge tribe of Jews. But each was very strong and was heavily fortified. And they had built in these fortress, fortresses and these citadels in a way that it was not easy for the enemy or for an outsider to attack them or at least to win the battle easily. When Rasulullah sallallahu with, uh, with his force and with his army was seen by this group of Jews who were getting out in the morning for their farming, for their cultivation, with their tools on their shoulders, they started screaming, Muhammad Wallahi, Muhammad Wallahi, that this is Muhammad. They knew the Prophet And they started saying, oh, Muhammad has come with his army. And the word that they use for the army is khamis. They did not say junood, the armies. They said wal khamis. And the army of the Prophet Because the Prophet came with a full set of armies. And the full set of army includes five battalions or five groups. So the army is divided into five sections. In Arabic, those are muqaddima, the forefront, the forward, baimana, the right side, maisara, the left side, qalb, the center, and then saqa, the reinforcement behind. So there were all five branches here. 
in the army of the Prophet And this was actually the first time that Arabs organized their, their armies. Before Rasulullah there was no sense of organization. They would just stampede and jump on each other. Rasulullah when he introduced this, he introduced organization, skill. And he organized this into five sections. The forward, the center, the right, the left, and the reinforcement, the backup. So, at that time, when Rasulullah heard them say, Muhammad wallahi wal khamiz, Muhammad and his army have arrived. At that time, Rasulullah uttered these words, Allahu Akbar, khaymat khaymat. Inna ila nazalna bisahati khawm, fasa'a sabahu mundarim. All praise is for Allah. Allah is great. The destruction has come to the heels of Khaybar. Indeed, when we arrive, when we descend on the courtyard of a nation, then the mourning of those nations is not a good one. This was a warning to the people of Khaybar that the time has come. And if you know the background, the context, the Prophet ﷺ was getting sick of the plotting that was taking place from here. This was actually the safe haven for the enemies of Islam. All the plotting, all the planning, all, all, all the consultation, everything, and even the weaponry was being provided from here. They had the largest uh, depots of weapons here in Khaybar. And they had large stocks of food here as well. And therefore, these were the only people who had citadels and fortresses. Makkans did not have any fortresses. And other, other communities, other tribes, they did not even know what fortresses. These people were the ones who were educated, were familiar with wars and stuff like that because they had come from other places. And Syrians, Romans, and uh, people in Jerusalem, all of them, they were aware of what a fortress is and all of that. So they had built these fortresses for their own defense. So Rasulullah arrived here and he tried to convince the leaders of all tribes in Khaybar to come to an agreement and come to a settlement, but they did not agree. And the prominent ones from the leaders of uh, Jews were, was Hu'i bin Akhtab and Kanana bin Rabir and Ibn Abi Huqayq. These were the prominent ones. The Prophet ﷺ did everything to convince them to make a settlement and not to ever uh, wage war on Medina or to support the enemies of Medina or something like that. But they did not agree. They said, we will fight. You can fight with us and we will fight to the last, last drop of blood in our body. So Rasulullah ordered the march on Khaybar. So they went through the citadels one by one. They conquered one citadel, then another, then another, until they came to the strongest and the most heavily fortified fortress, which was known as the fortress of Qamus. This was the strongest of all of them and the most fortified. And the champion, the guard or the commander of this fortress was known as Marhab. Marhab was known for, for his bravery, for his strength, for his might and for his experience and skill in wars. 
throughout the Arabian Peninsula. So, on that fortress, first Abu Bakr was given the flag of Islam, so he attacked the fortress and he did everything that he could, but he failed. Then Umar the next day was given the flag, he did everything, but he failed. Then some other prominent Sahaba, each day tries were made, but every effort result in failure. No, nothing was succeeding. So the siege on this fortress, on this citadel, lasted for nearly 19 days. Finally, one night, Rasulullah announced amongst the Sahaba, he said, tomorrow I will give the flag of Islam to someone who loves Allah and His Messenger. So the next morning, everyone was anxious to see who will get to carry the flag of Islam from the hands of the Prophet And the next morning, when Rasulullah finished Salat al-Fajr, he asked for Ali radiallahu anhu. At that time, everyone knew that it is going to be Ali radiallahu anhu who will get the flag from the Prophet So when Rasulullah asked for Ali radiallahu anhu, he was told that Ali has some pain in his eyes. So Rasulullah called him and then uh, he put his uh, saliva in the eyes of Ali that immediately gave him comfort and shifa. And then Rasulullah gave the flag to Ali with specific instructions. He said, when you go there, the first thing that you must do is that you invite these people to Islam. And there Rasulullah said that famous statement that is always quoted, that even if one person embraces Islam through your invitation, through your da'wah, that is better for you than claiming 100 red camels in spoil, in, in spoils of war. Because even if one person is saved from hell and enters into Jannah through your invitation, that is better for you than the whole world and everything that it contains. So there were other specific instructions that were given to Ali radiallahu as well. Finally, Ali radiallahu prepared he put on his armor and he went on the door of this citadel. And Marhab, who was the guard and the champion, he came out and he started praising himself. He said, Qad alimat khaybar ana ladhi al marhab. Khaybar knows very well that I'm Khaybar, uh, I'm Marhab. And I'm the one who sometimes throws a spear and sometimes brandons his sword and kills with his sword. I'm the one known for his experience. I'm the one who has skill of war. At that time, Ali on the other side, he said, Indeed, the Khaybar knows I am the one who has been named Haider by my mother. And Haider is another word in Arabic for a lion. He said, I am the lion. And if you have the courage to fight with me, then bring it on. Ali was a very young and brave soldier. So, Marhab attacked Ali and Ali escaped. When Ali attacked him, and this guy Marhab was not only huge, big, and strong, but he was fully armed. There was the only the, the only hole in his armor that he had was the one uh, from the eyes, so he could see. 
So Ali radiallahu anhu pierced his sword through the, uh, through the eyes and he killed him immediately. And then the Muslim army marched on the citadel and they uh, conquered that as well. Let's read a hadith to highlight some of these things here and then uh, we will end this inshallah. It's one of the very interesting stories from the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The hadith is narrated by Abdullah bin Maslama radiallahu anhu. He said that Salama bin Akwa radiallahu anhu told us the story that we left with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for Khaybar and we traveled throughout the night. While we were traveling, one man from those in the caravan, he said to Amir bin Akwa radiallahu anhu, the brother of Salama radiallahu anhu, that, oh Amir, why don't you, uh, why don't you uh, sing some poetry for us? وَكَانَ عَامِرْ رَجُلًا شَعِنْ And Amir was known to be a very good poet. فَنَزَلَ يَحْدُ بِالْقَوْمِ يَقُولُ So, Amir radiallahu anhu started uh, saying these couplets. اللَّهُمَّ لَوْلَا أَنْتَ مَهْتَدَيْنَا Allah, if you were not in this universe, we would, not, we would have never found guidance. Nor we would have given any charity, nor would we have offered any prayers. Allah, forgive us as long as we remain righteous. And send down upon us tranquility. And Give us steadfastness and firmness if we meet the enemy. Inna ila siha bina ataina. Whenever we are called to fight, we come. Wa bi siyahi awwal mu alaina. And we we answer the calls of those who attack us. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi heard this and he said, Man hadha sa'i. Who's who's reading or saying these uh, these ashar? The, the companions replied, Amir bin Akwa. It is Amir bin Akwa radiallahu Qal, Yarhamahullah. At that time, Rasulullah said, May Allah have mercy upon him. So whenever Rasulullah at the time of a battle would say about someone, May Allah forgive him or may Allah have mercy on him, the Sahaba had understood that it means that this person will die in this battle. So when they heard Rasulullah sallallahu saying Yarhamullah about Amir bin Akwa radiallahu anh, Umar radiallahu anh got up and he said, Wajabat ya Nabi Allah, O Prophet of Allah, now the martyrdom is, is confirmed for him. And then they said, Law amta'atana bi. We wish you would have given us some more time with Amir bin Akwa radiallahu anh so we could have benefited from him more. Fa'atayna khaybat. When we came to Khaybar, فَحَاصَرْنَاهُمْ We seized them. حَتَّى أَصَابَتْنَا مَخْمَسَةٌ شَدِيدًا We became, we uh, started uh, starving because of uh, hunger. ثُمَّ إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى فَتَحَا عَلَيْهِمْ Then Allah gave us victory over the people of Khaybar. فَلَمَّا أَمْسَ النَّاسُ مَسَاءَ الْيَوْمِ When it was evening, on the day that we got the victory, people started uh, put, in, put in fire and they started cooking. There was a lot of fires. Every family or every small group of companions started cooking something. The Prophet cited the fires and he said, What is this fire? What's going on? And he said, What are you guys cooking? So the Sahaba replied that we're cooking meat. Rasulullah asked, where did the meat come from? We don't have any meat. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we're cooking the meat of domesticated uh, donkeys. We're eating donkeys. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa immediately said, Ahriquha wa He said, 
spill everything that you have been cooking and even break the, the pots that you were using to cook the meat of donkeys. فَقَالَ رَجُلُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَوَا نُهْرِيقُهَا وَنَفْسُلُهَا He said, Ya Rasulullah, can we just spill whatever we were cooking and wash the pots instead of breaking them? Rasulullah said, Oh, that, okay, that's fine as well. If you just drop, if you spill whatever you were cooking and wash the pots and pans. فَلَمَّا تَصَافَ الْقَوْمِ كَانَ سَيْفُ عَامِرٍ قَصِيرًا So during the time of the battle, Amir radiallahu anhu, he was fighting with someone and his sword was very short. فَتَنَاوَلَ بِهِ سَاقَ يَهُودِيٍ لِيَضْرِبَهُ So he was fighting with another person from Khaybar and he tried to hit him but the sword came back and hit him on his knee instead. فَأَصَابَ عِنِّ رُقْبَةِ عَامِرْ فَمَاتَ مِنْهُ And he started bleeding heavily and he died because of that. قَالْ فَلَمَّا قَفَلُوا When people were returning from Khaybar after all the settlement, I'm not going to uh, go about uh, going to the details of the aftermath and how the settlements took place. Uh, and there were very few casualties. At the end of this war, 93 from the people of Khaybar died and about 16 Sahaba died. So, and the war lasted for nearly 20 days. So, it was very carefully planned and very carefully uh, worked out. So, when people were returning from Khaybar to Medina, uh, Salama radiallahu uh, narrates that Rasulullah sallallahu saw me and he was holding my hand and he asked, he, he realized that I'm a little sad because his brother died. His brother was Amr who passed away, who were martyred. So Rasulullah realized that Salama is a uh, is little sad. So he asked him, he said, what, what, what's going on? Why do I see you sad? So Salama said uh, to Rasulullah Fidaka bi ummi, may my mother and father be sacrificed upon you. Zaramu and Amiran Habit Amr. People are assuming that my brother has lost all his good deeds because his own sword ended, ended up killing him. So people thought he committed suicide. And if someone commits suicide, then the ruling is that he is going to hell. So Salama was a little disheartened and sad because some people were thinking that since he died from his own sword, so maybe his, he lost all his good deeds. So Rasulullah said, Kazaba man qalahu. He lied, whoever said such a thing. Inna lahu ajrain. Indeed, for your brother, he got two reward, double reward. Wa jama'a bayna isba'in. And he said like this, Inna hu lajahidun wa mujahidun. Lajahidun mujahidun. Indeed, he struggled and he fought in the path of Allah. Qalla arabiyun mashabiha mithlahu. There are very few Arabs who walked like him, who showed strength and bravery like him. Any questions? Subhanallah, Muhammad, the Lord, 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 the اللهم إنا نسألك العفة والعافية والمعافاة الدائمة في الدين والدنيا والآخرة اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزينه في قلوبنا وكذره إلينا الكفر والفسوق والعصيان واجعلنا من الراشدين ربنا أتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Next week إن شاء الله we have the Ikna Relief Banquet here at the same time next Friday. So we ask all of you to please come and show your support. Uh, share the, the word with your friends, with your family members, with your colleagues. So more and more people can come and join this cause, inshallah. There will be guest speakers from different states uh, who will be coming uh, to help uh, this.